So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. All right. Um, I wanted to uh, just uh, finish out that development as it was uh, taken up by Max Kepler, because uh, as I said to you uh, earlier today or last night, that in 1974, Max gave that presentation of the Dorley Matrix. And at that time, the whole question of what a matrix is came more sharply into focus. Max uh, knew that a matrix had to have indices and that it had to have a subject. But John Dorley had never given the indices and he had never given the subject. He had given the indices in a very general way. By that I mean he had said that the uh, I index was indeed word, Christ, Christianity, and science, and that the J index was indeed word, Christ, Christianity, and science. But you can't have a matrix if your I index and your J index are of the same values. You can only have something coming out which is new, something coming forth in the array which is new, if you have different values in the I and in the J. And so it was uh, his task then to take up the question, what aspect of word, Christ, Christianity, and science constitute the I index, and which aspect of word, Christ, Christianity, and science constitutes the J index? So that we have something in the I index, we have values that are not just any old values of the word Christ, Christianity, and science, but they have something, uh, a great common denominator going through them. And that in the J index, those four of the J are not just any old four that we might think of or that we might like to put down, but that they, are, they have a common denominator and that it is the right common denominator. In other words, that it actually, actually, actually does uh, epitomize the whole horizontal that it is stating, you see. That the J index is absolutely true to what it is, uh, what is being stated in the in the verticals. John Dorley had given the epitomes, you see there, that we have the epitome uh, at the point of word as word, order, word as Christ, identity, then line, omnipotence, and so on. We have 16 epitomes, one at each point of intersection, to help us to grasp that point of intersection. Can you see that uh, John Dorley left us with a matrix that was um, 
almost entirely but not entirely in the language of the 7,000 year period that he gave a little touch of the 6,000 year period just so that we could hang on get a handle get a thread on the whole thing until we could uh, attain that consciousness that perhaps will not even need those epitomies but will be able to speak and converse in the pure language of the capitalized terms. Is it the word matrix? We don't know, certainly yet, but we do know that this matrix is somehow different from the other matrices that we have looked at that it may indeed be a master matrix. A master matrix that, by the way, will make us a master if we master it. <laughs> master it in the best sense, that is, to, to become one with it. We look at our indices here when we look at that I index, we see that it's what? As the word, the self-declaration of God. When we look at the Christ, well, you have here the, for the Christ was changed to the self-translation of God, God's own self-translation of himself. In Christianity, it is God's infinite self-reflection. And in science, God's self-interpretation as science. Now you have to hear something. And it's a question, do we hear it? We can look at those values this way, we can say the self-declaration of God, the self-translation of God, the self-reflection of God, and the self-interpretation of God. And if we put the accent on uh, the wrong part of that value, we don't see the value. We miss the common denominator of the whole index, the I index. So we have to, to ask, what is the common thread in those four? It's the self, isn't it? And so that self has the predominance. And then it is qualified, qualified first by the word, then by the Christ, then by Christianity than by science. And so it is uh, the self-declaration of God, the self-translation of God, the infinite self-reflection of God, and God's uh, self-interpretation as science. And if I know my tonalities of the levels, I feel at once that this is a different value than the other three matrices have, level-wise. It's a different level. It is not absolute Christian science, but it is that which has the touch of the divine within it, huh? divine science. Do you hear that? It's the self, huh? the self-declaration of the word. The self-translation, oh, it's a gorgeous thing. That's why it must be in synonymous terms, I mean in capitalized terms. The array has to be expressed in capitalized terms. It's the self of God. It's that sense of divine science where you have the seven and the four, that the idea of the principle 
is the sevenfold nature of God and the fourfold operation of God. This comes forth first on the level of divine science, coming right out of that infinite one principle which holds within itself its own infinite idea. And that the moment that idea is expressed, we get the self, the selfhood of God, and that selfhood is the seven and the four. That's what we have. Is it not? The seven and the four in the array. So that's the I index, and then we can look at the J index, and we read those values as the word, the creative basis. Again, I need to tell you that we have added basis to creative, that uh, when Max Kapler first uh, um, set forth those values, he had only creative, but he himself referred to the creative basis when speaking uh, through the uh, presentation of this matrix in 1974. So we touched on the word aspect as the creative basis. We're just weighing them now. We're listening. We're listening with our tonality to see if we can hear a common thread or a common denominator, and if we can characterize that common denominator with a, uh, with a category. So we have the creative basis as though to show that every order, every one of those four orders has a uh, something foundational about it. You see there are other ways to say it, that it's, a, it's the uh, foundation of, the creative foundation of, or the uh, primal uh, creative basis of. Whatever stays within that field of tonality to help you to feel what's going on there, and you will feel that. We will feel it as we touch each one of these four aspects of the whole creative basis of the word. And then we come to the Christ selfhood, to a term that isn't uh, really easy to define. We have to talk around it, and again, it comes out most clearly when one is, is working with it, one is taking the, the different values of the capitalized terms at each point of intersection in that horizontal. But it is more or less something like this that the Christ selfhood is the ability, the faculty of the Christ now to take the creative basis, to take what has been given in the creative basis and to restructure it, to rework it, to, um, to turn it into something new, to take the it's the same sort of thing that you have in the days of creation, if you know the, the breaks of the four within the days of creation. You have the word as the word aspect. You have your uh, primal creativity, your primal creative elements, don't you? And then the second aspect, as the Christ comes in, the Christ takes that and works with it. And we call that abundant translation, that the Christ takes the primal elements in the days of creation and can reproduce those infinitely, can reproduce those elements without end. It's the sense of uh, uh, bringing out the sense of immortality. And then at the point of Christianity, you have the whole um, outcome of the primal elements of creativity and the abundant translation of those elements as Christianity as the um, multiplication and abundance, I think, is the characterization there. So here you see on the overhead that I have put up the, uh, the days of creation with the breaks within them 
showing the layout of the word in its four aspects. That's what I'm uh, uh, talking to you about. That uh, it's it's so interesting to keep in mind that that John Dorley uh, found the ordering, the structuring of the matrix, and then he saw this order, this order of the four within the days of creation. And there's a, a very something very close there that is taking place. So in the days of creation, it's, it's very easy to see this, that from the point of mind as mind to soul as spirit, you have the word aspect of the word. And that, that whole section of the days of creation gives you the primal elements of creativity, primal creativity, it's, it's everything you have to work with. You have, in that point of the word is the word, everything you need for the complete fulfillment of creativity. Those primal elements. But then you need the Christ, the word is the Christ, to come in and say, I can take that. That's what the Christ says at the point of soul as soul, and that whole uh, subtone carries over to life as spirit. And the Christ says, I, now I can take that and do something with it. I can calculate with that. We even get a touch of the science order. We're going to hear it all again when we get to the science order, the science vertical in the matrix, which is really so natural to see that every one of those first three verticals of the word, the Christ, Christianity, is picking up the, the impression of science. It, it has the whole impress of science on it. And so, in a sense, the science order is coining and stamping the other three orders. Excuse me if I get carried away. <laughs> you have to bring me back to where I was. <laughs> but it's, it's so exciting to see the, the correlations. And um, so the Christ takes the primal elements of creativity and says, I can work with that, I can restructure that. And in restructuring that, there's, there's a translation going on, a Christ translation of the elements, and then it's abundant translation. There's no limitation to it, no limitation to it at all. It's that sense of the seed within itself. And then we come to Christianity, and Christianity is always the outcome, always the realm that holds the whole output of the, of the Word and the Christ. And so at the point of life as soul, going to the, uh, the other extent of truth as principle, you have that um, whole realm of the multiplication of Christianity, the multiplication and dominion. Of that, of that field. And finally, in the word as science, which uh, picks up at truth as life and goes through to the conclusion of love as love, you have the bringing back of the whole thing or the lifting of creation to its higher standpoint. Um, really, as though science would say to us, actually there never was anything that had to be created. It was always there that I, science, am word, Christ, and Christianity. I am, and I am what I am. And so you have the sense of the wholeness and completion and infinity of science. Now that same kind of thing is felt perhaps with a little more absolute touch to it in the Dorley matrix. So we go back to the, the Dorley matrix and the J index, you see? So you had the creative basis. You hear that? Creative elements. Here it's the creative basis. Then we have the Christ selfhood. The Christ now able to take each one of those bases, 
at the point of word is word, Christ is word, Christianity is word, science is word, those four great creative bases. And to work with those in such a way as to reorganize them, to reorganize the elements, to restructure the elements, to rework the elements, to bring out new aspects of those very same basic primal elements. And this happens in each one of those four orders. And then to the point of Christianity, Christianity as the pure demonstration. So there is a demonstration coming out of the workings of the Christ upon the basis of the word, and that is a pure demonstration. And you can see that the whole field, really the whole, uh, whole array, is a pure uh, demonstration of Christianity. And finally, to the point of science, again, now lifting the tone. You know that always when you reach science, you get a lift in the tone. Sometimes you feel also a descent. This is from the higher levels at the point of science. You will feel a descent. But in Christian science, you feel a lifting <laughs> because you're going the ascending way. And on the descent, you feel a descent in it. And so here it is an, a lifting of the whole thing to the point of God being to show really uh, the feedback principle on the level of Christian science uh, as you see what we're looking at here is the whole field of negative feedback. <laughs> we're looking at Christian science, are we not? Is that not where the negative feedback circuit of the divine self-organizing principle is? Do you see how positive that negative feedback circuit is? Yeah. Well, so always at the point of science, you touch the feedback aspect of the calculus. And um, so the God being, the sense of God being, will uh, gather up the creative basis, the Christ selfhood and the pure demonstration, gather it right back up into it itself, you see. That's implicate in science. That's implicate in the God being, the God being of each order. And the God being of the word order, implicate there and explicated through the word as word, word is Christ and word is Christianity, is the creative basis of the word, the Christ selfhood of the word, and the pure demonstration of the word. That's all held within the God-beingness of the word order. It's nice, huh? And you can take that with each one of the, the orders, and in this way we begin to prepare ourselves to, to go through that uh, matrix. You see, it's so important to get uh, as much as possible the... the um, hierarchy of categories, the hierarchy of tones that will determine now the, everything that we see in the array. Every point of intersection that we uh, touch will be affected by and will be the effect of these uh, indice values, index values. So um, as the I index and the J index work together, they bring out the array. I've left something out. What I've left out is what common denominator, if any, do you feel going through the J index? What 
What do we feel there? The level of absolute Christian science. Yes, I think so. I think so. It's, um, you know, science, as a scientist, you have to, to weigh values, don't you? And uh, you can perhaps begin weighing them in terms of absolute and relative. That even works here, because if you look at the I index values, you can say they are, in relation to the J index, more absolute. And the I index in relation to the, or the, sorry, the J index in relation to the I index is more relative. But we don't say by that that one is absolute and one is relative. I've only said one is more relative in relation to the other, and the other is more absolute in relationship to the other. So if I have a divine, if I have divine values in my I index, these are more absolute than the absolute values in my J index. So the J index is more relative, but it's absolute. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Now you have to buy the tapes, huh? <laughs> Either that or give up. <laughs> so it appears that we have in our indices the I index with values that are of the quality of divine science, have the touch of divine science, that, that uh, convey the tonality of the calculus in divine science, and that in the J index, we have those values that are not really on the level of Christian science, not quite. Perhaps if we look at our days of creation, we certainly feel uh, their values of Christian science, but somehow these values stand a little higher, a little more above, they are, uh, in a sense, giving the atmosphere of absolute Christian science. So what do we have in the array? Can you see what's going on? Is a kind of a law of interdependence between divine science and absolute Christian science? And that brings out Christian science. Isn't that beautiful? So we have, since our I index is always the dominant, and the J index is the subdominant, we will have that feeling that the I is governing, is, uh, is somehow um, oh, permeating, permeating the whole tone, so that even as we come to the level of Christian science, we see that we see Christian science in the language of divine science. That's what we have. Don't take this for granted. Put that in your notes because you're going to wonder later, what was that she said about that? We see Christian science in the language of divine science. What is the language of divine science? Capitalized terms, yes. Yes, synonymous terms. It's the 7,000 year period language. So that array brings out the 
the blending or the reflection of divine science with absolute Christian science, and, and that is affecting or bringing forth uh, Christian science. Um, it's as though divine science and absolute Christian science then can be seen to be the matrix that holds or embeds within itself Christian science. That divine science and absolute Christian science bring to birth Christian science. And they show us that Christian science is divine. They indicate that. They, uh, that's the message we see there, and it will become clearer to us. And um, I think as we move more and more into the 7,000-year period, we will begin to feel the practical implications of what that means for our lives, that, that Christian science is divine, and it will take the duality out of our lives. That duality that says we're here on some level that is not quite good. It's got good and bad. It has nice experiences and not so nice experiences. It has uh, good and evil. It has order and chaos. It has predictability and unpredictability, certainty and uncertainty, stability and instability. All these things that, that we think, all these aspects that we think are two values and that are really all the time one value. And this is what love is going to, to bring us into, the one valued logic. The one valued logic. The logic of divine science which shows us that our experience is divine. That our life is divine. That everything in our life experience is divine, that the human is divine. And we get touches of that, we get glimpses of that in our, in our work, in our practice, and that's why we need our experiences so that we don't become just um, all heady about about our science, that it isn't just in the head, head stuff, but that it's, it's real, tangible, living reality to us. <laughs>